Last week, we closed out chapter 4 of John. We saw the healing of the son of this unnamed uh, figure of royalty from Capernaum, a man who traveled a day's journey so that he could find Jesus, uh, hoping that this man who was teaching and speaking with such great authority uh, would be able to help his son. Uh, the, the scene that I described regarding this, this, this leader uh, and his son was his father was desperate. His father had tried everything to find a way for his son to get healed using his, his power, his influence, his wealth, doing everything that he could possibly do and coming to Jesus, traveling uh, a day away to find this person who is, who is teaching uh, with authority, uh, just hoping that Jesus, that this man could heal his son physically, hoping that, that, that Jesus' verbal expression would somehow equate to Jesus also having authority over the physical world. And one of the things that we see is that Jesus does indeed have authority over the physical world. So he speaks with authority, he has authority, he, he exerts authority in the physical world. And all of this points to remind us, to demonstrate to us that Jesus has authority over also the spiritual things. Or in other words, Jesus has authority in all areas that we might imagine, and perhaps even things that we cannot imagine. But Jesus has all authority. And after this member of royalty recognizes that Jesus has this type of authority, uh, what we see happening is that this royal figure uh, comes to believe in Jesus. And not only does he believe in Jesus, but also we see his entire household lands up believing in Jesus. And interestingly, if we stopped in John at this point, we might be led to believe, why doesn't Jesus reach all people in this same way? If this is the model that, that brings people to faith, why doesn't Jesus do this same thing that we see happening, uh, what we've seen in John up in these four chapters. That is, that Jesus shows up, he speaks authoritatively, he does amazing uh, uh, miracles and signs. The reaction from the person witnessing these miracles or signs is that they come to faith. And then, as we might say, or we often hear, after that, they live happily ever after. But one of the things that we're going to see as we transition in our text is that we see that believing is oftentimes not that simple or straightforward. And from this point forward in John, we are going to be faced with that reality. Uh, we're starting a new section in John as we start in chapter 5 of John. Chapter 5 to chapter 8 opens up this new section. And, and we are going to be faced with the reality that just because people see miraculous events, they see these signs... The reaction isn't always that they come to faith. In fact, most often the reaction isn't that they come to faith, but we see something different, which is strange when you think about it, because rationally, if you're just you know, thinking this through, you would think that if you have this person who is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, and he's doing things that only God can do, and he's revealing himself for who he is to people who he wants to follow him, you would think that you would just follow him. But when we consider the sinfulness, the, the fallen nature of man and woman, um, it begins to make sense why we just don't rationally think this through and just come to the, the natural conclusion of when you're faced with who Jesus is and recognize who Jesus is, that you just, as the song says, surrender all and, and come to him. But we recognize that we are stuck with a sinful nature because of the fall. And it does pollute our thinking. It does pollute our desires. It, 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 it changes how we approach certain things. And, and as we're going to see in our text going forward, there are 
many people who, who not only reject Jesus, but the response is that they are hostile towards Jesus. They're hostile towards the gospel message. And I think we all understand that is not something that is unique to the first century. It's something that we see um, perhaps with, sadly, uh, too much frequency even in our, own, in our own day. My goal this morning as we look at the first nine verses of chapter 5 is as we look at this event between Jesus and this man who's des- described as an invalid, as, as he's described as somebody who's disabled, is I don't want us to see this event as simply uh, an event between Jesus and this man and you know, how wonderful it is that this man is healed. Uh, but instead, I want us to recognize that, that we actually share far more similarities with this invalid, this disabled man, then I think most of us are comfortable in acknowledging and admitting to other people. And I'm hoping today to to draw that out, and I'm hoping that we will see it. And of course, the good news is that just as Jesus saves this invalid of his his physical ailments, um, I think that we'll recognize that Jesus saves us for something far greater than just whatever physical ailments we may be enduring. So I'd like to invite you to turn to John chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 to 9. When you find your place, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Um, What I'm going to read here um, does not include verse 4 on your screen, so I'm actually going to read verse 4 from my notes so that we have that, and then I'll address it when I'm get done praying for us. So verse 1, chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades, in which lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed, Waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel of the Lord went down at, a certain, at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of water was healed of whatever disease he had. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool, and when the water is stirred, and and while I am going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, and take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, this beautiful place that you have Put us, Lord, that we can come together as your people to worship you, to study your word. Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word, that you would instruct us in it, that it would transform us, that it would change us, that it would draw us closer to you. Father, I pray, Lord, that in our time this morning, that that we would humble ourselves before you to recognize that we need you most. And Father, I pray, Lord, that as we come together as we study your word, that this would be evident that this is something that we would apply in our own life and that you would do that work in us. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is sort of a side note. The reason why I had to read verse 4 out of my notes and not in my Bible is um, many of the modern translations, which I'm reading from, English Standard Version, um, uses uh, earlier dated manuscripts. Um, So typically, just so that you know, that's typically called like the Alexandrian text type, the the type of text that comes out of Egypt. Um, Commonly, like the King James Bible, the New King James Bible, and some other translations use a a later text type, the, the Byzantine text type, uh, more uh, towards uh, Turkey, um, and it is the most common text type because it is the uh, newer text type. There's more of it, and it includes verse 4, which I just read. Um, verse 4 in this text, and the reason why I read it, 
was because it adds a lot of detail of why these people are sitting around this pool. And without verse 4, um, if we just look at a modern translation, we might scratch our heads and wonder to ourselves, why are they there? What are they doing? What are they waiting for? Um, so it is actually a very important verse, and um, so I wanted to be sure that we had it as we go through this text. Um, and if we ever want to have a conversation on Bible translations, we can certainly have that at a later time. But of course, now is probably not the appropriate time for us to have that discussion. So as chapter 5 begins, the Apostle John acknowledges that some time had passed from when we last left or last saw Jesus. Uh, he was in the area of Galilee. It's when he was uh, doing what, what I mentioned earlier uh, in this area of Galilee, uh, Cana, and this this man from Capernaum comes to him, uh, so begging that, that he would heal his sick son. And that's where we left the text. We left the text. Chapter 4 ends with Jesus healing this, 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 this royal figure son, him coming to faith, his household coming to faith, and the chapter ends. As chapter 5 opens up, John wants us to know that some time has passed. He doesn't tell us how much time has passed, but time has passed, and enough time has passed for Jesus to make his way from this area of, of Galilee, which is up north, and back down to this area of Jerusalem. And so that's the location that this is taking place. And it's happening during a time of, of one of the Jewish feasts in Jerusalem. So as you might imagine, uh, Jerusalem is, is bustling with people at this time, and that is the place. And then John gives us greater detail. He says, and then in Jerusalem, there's this place. Do you guys know the place? It, it's where the, the sheep gate is. And by the sheep gate, there's a pool there. And in fact, this area of, of Bethesda is actually an area of, of two pools, two rectangular pools that are a little bit outside the, the town of, of, of near where the temple is located. And these two pools on, on both sides of these rectangular pools are, are two colonnades, two like roofed porches. And in the middle of these two rectangular pools is, is another roofed colonnade to pe protect the people that assemble there um, from the sun. This area that is called the Sheep Gate is a, is a small gate or door that was used to transport the, the sheep uh, into the temple area, and these sheep were used either sold to people that needed to make an offering or a sacrifice, or they were provided to the temple, and because there was a, a natural spring in this area, uh, there was thought to be some purification baths that the Jewish people would use to purify the sheep, and then they would send it through the sheep gate, and then they would go off to basically being slaughtered. And so this area of Bethesda is the scene for where Jesus is. And this Bethesda means the house of mercy, or, or implied in the name, house of divine mercy. And these people would come there, not because it had any Jewish uh, religious significance. Uh, this place wasn't important to Judaism, uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that is a bit disappointing is that, uh, that this place had, had sort of gained a, um, a, a natural uh, religious uh, significance. Uh, people uh, was kind of embracing the, the, the pagan beliefs of, of healing shrines that existed in this place uh, because of some of the other religions that existed around Judaism. And we have people here, a, a certain group of people that... They were holding to this, this mythology, this superstitious belief that if they could get into this pool of water at the right time, during the right season, when it was, when it was stirring, when it was moving, when you could see bubbles or, or some form of, of movement in the water, if they could just get into the pool first, maybe, just maybe, they would be the recipients of, of this divine healing that they were so desperately seeking and so with that belief, we see that this area had many people that were just desperate, desperate for, for healing. Verse 3 describes the scene that in this area, 
lay a multitude of invalids or, or people who were sick. And when we say that they were sick, obviously we're not talking about people who just had the cold or they were just a little bit nauseous that day. He goes on to provide a description of the type of disabilities that were present there in, at Beth, Bethsaida. Bethesda. People who were blind, lame, disfigured, or paralyzed. The scene John is painting here for us is that are are people who who cannot fix themselves. Uh, Their situation is dire, a a cure unrealistic. So imagine 100 to 200 people sitting or or laying around these these pools, just, just waiting for a chance to be healed by something or someone and they didn't know who, they, they didn't understand how this process worked, but they had, they had convinced themselves that this superstition, this superstition must be true. That if they could just follow whatever rules of this myth or superstition, that, that they could have a chance to be healed. Just sitting there, waiting, hour by hour, day by day, month by month, just waiting for a chance, their last chance in their minds to be able to get into this pool of water. Not just get in this pool of water, but you had to be first to get into this pool of water. These people are so desperate for a cure to their ailments that they had embraced this superstition as the answer to, the woe, to their woes. You know, this place represents two problems among the Jewish people, and it reminds us of the sort of the state of Judaism even at this time. Uh, the first thing is, again, this is not a Jewish place of worship. This isn't a, a sacred Jewish place. Uh, this isn't uh, he, uh, Jewish at all. There, there's no Jewish tradition that's associated with these pools that would encourage people to seek out this type of superstitious healing. This place is very much a remnant of the, of the pagan religions that existed in this land at this time. And so, for one, it's this reminder that the Jewish people still had not done a good job at at separating themselves from the religions of the land. They continued to make many of the same religious mistakes that were outlined in the Old Testament, that, that God warned Israel over, that Moses warned Israel over, that Joshua warned Israel over. And we see even now, even after they have been exiled many times, their land destroyed and, and pilfered, they continue to accept the philosophies and the religions of, of many of the people around them. And the second thing that comes from this recognition that Bethesda exists and it had this, this, this mythology surrounding it is the fact that the Jewish leaders uh, ignored it. Uh, There are hundreds, maybe 200 Jewish people that would come to this pool at Bethesda to sit around waiting for this opportunity to be healed from something that they are unfamiliar with. They they don't know what's happening. They just know that there's a chance if they participate in this religious ritual that maybe that they will be healed. And instead of the Jewish religious leaders opposing it, and, and pointing all of these people who are broken and sick and disabled, instead of pointing them to the God of Israel, the one true and living God, the religious leaders just ignored them. And they didn't ignore them because it was convenient. They ignored them because these Jewish leaders wanted nothing to do with these types of people. It's important for us to recognize that that Jewish leaders, if you were a priest, if you were a scribe, if you wanted to participate in in these feasts, you had to maintain your your purity. And part of that purity was, yes, following God's law, following God's ordinances in in maintaining that purity, uh, but it also meant you had to stay away from people who were imperfect, 
physically imperfect. And here they all were, 100 of them, 200 of them, sitting around these two pools. The Jewish people, the leaders didn't just ignore this, this, this pagan ritual, this pagan shrine that seemed to be very close to them. But in many ways, they probably encouraged it because in their minds, it gave them the opportunity to not have to, to touch these people, to not have to deal with these people. Just forget that they're even a part of, of their community. And that's what kind of makes part of this stand out so So much because while the religious leaders of Judaism wanted nothing to do with these people, John records Jesus going directly there. Right? I hope we recognize when we look at stories involving Jesus, uh, Jesus doesn't just accidentally stumble upon people. Uh, Bethesda is not some place that that was on the way to something. Uh, Jesus went to Bethesda knowing what he would find there who he would find there. You know, it's it's crazy to think that as Jesus walks into this this area where these two pools exist, and as Jesus looks out at this crowd of people, of 100, maybe 200 people, that it's important for us to recognize that, that Jesus isn't simply looking at this mass of people, but rather, I want us to Understand that when Jesus looks out at a sea of people, he just doesn't see a mass mob. What he sees are individuals. He sees individual people. And in this instance, he sees one particular person that he picks out of this crowd that that, that captures Jesus' attention. Acknowledging this one individual. And I think sometimes that that we need to remind ourselves that when we are, are dealing with, with problems, maybe many of the same problems that the, of people that are around us, for us to be reminded that, that we are not just in a, a one name that, that God knows. We're not just one person that God knows. That, that Jesus has a, a personal a care and empathy towards us. When we lift up our prayers to Jesus, it's not just one of a sea of prayers. It isn't like the Catholic model of prayer that, that, you know what, if we just pray to the right person who isn't doing anything at that time, maybe that saint will bring that prayer to God at the right time and he'll wheel and deal for us and you know, he'll, he'll get that prayer answered. What a ridiculous model. It's for us to recognize that when the Lord hears our prayers, it isn't a a mass confusion of prayer. He hears us and he knows us. Just as we see here in this incident here, in this event, Jesus stands before a sea of people and there is one person that Jesus is able to engage. There's one person among the crowd that Jesus fixates his attention to at this moment. Verse 5 describes the man. He had been an invalid for 38 years. And then verse 6, Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there for a long time. And he said to him, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? You know, we read this and some commentaries even comment on this. What a weird question to ask somebody who is an invalid, who's disabled. I mean, surely Jesus knew just by the situation, that that question didn't need to be asked. One of the, the examples that I read from a commentary, and he was talking about how it's like, it's like one of the dumbest questions you can ask somebody is when you see somebody on the side of the road and their hood's up, steam's coming out of their car, you see the, the guy standing over his hood, and then you stop by and say what? Having car problems? <laughs> no, I, I do this on weekends. It's a good time. That's the situation here. That's the description that this commentary writer presents, is that Jesus is among people who are disabled, and his question is, hey, do you want to be healed? Again, this guy, this man, has been coming to this place, Bethesda, for we don't know how long. Day by day, month by month, maybe years. Maybe it's where the family has just dumped this man, hoping that, you know what, while he's here, he's not our problem. We'll come by once in a while, drop off some food. 
but he's in, he's in God's hands. And Jesus asks this man this question, do you want to be healed? And yet the answer that this man gives Jesus, it, it demonstrates a, a disconnect between what this man is thinking, and by this man I mean even what we often think when we bring our needs to God. Sometimes our prayers to God recognize that we're not thinking big enough. Or we're not addressing the, the proper problem that's in our life. You know, oftentimes we see God put something before us and the way we respond shows a, this common disconnect, this, this issue that pollutes our thinking, it, it pollutes our, our lives. Jesus asks this man, do you want to be healed? And the man responds this way, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred and, and while I'm going to the, to the water, another person gets there before me. That isn't the question Jesus asked. Jesus didn't ask this man, hey, why, why haven't you been healed yet? Like, why, why hasn't the water been effective? What have you done for yourself to, to be sure that, that you're the healthiest you you can be? Uh, what have you done to, to, to fix your physical situation? Who have you talked to about this, this problem that you're having? These are not the questions Jesus asked. This man. The question Jesus asked this man was simple, straightforward. Do you want to be healed? And in the same way, Jesus asks us that very same question. Whenever the gospel is placed before us, that is the question that's at the forefront of the good news of Jesus. Do you want to be healed? And of course, many of us, knowing who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished, we recognize that the question that Jesus is asking is not simply about physical restoration, but rather Jesus provides complete Restoration. He provides healing from the all encompassing, comprehensive, destructive effects of sin. You know, sometimes I, I think that we think that sin only separates us from God. And yes, sin separates us from God. And that is tragic and dangerous and scary to recognize. The, the, the damaging effects that sin has on our relationship with a, with a thrice holy God. But I also want us to recognize that sin, sin that's in us, sin that we continue to live out, sin that we do not repent from, it affects all of our relationships. Sin affects our relationships with one another. It affects your relationship with, your, with a husband and a wife. It affects a, a relationship between a, a husband, wife, and the kids. Sin has damaging effects. It extends far beyond just our relationship with God. Do you want to be healed? Do you want your marriage Healed? Do you want your depression healed? Do you want your stress healed? Do you want your job frustrations healed? The question being posed to this disabled man is not simply limited to physical healing. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul affirms that Christ came to save sinners. In John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus says that he came to give life and give life abundantly. And what I want us to remember is that abundant life does not begin when this physical life ceases. The abundant life that Jesus is offering is a life that, that begins the moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ. The moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ, moment by moment, 
Minute by minute, day by day, month by month, year by year, God is transforming you, changing your life, not just improving it a little bit. It is a radical transformation that Scripture defines as a new creation. The old has passed away. The language of Scripture is dramatic to help us understand the difference between another Bible phrase, the old man and the new man. Our life is changed dramatically. Everything in our life, moment by moment, day by day, challenge by challenge, blessing by blessing. All of the impact and pollution of sin is brought under the power and forgiveness of Christ. As Paul writes in Romans 6, we have all been set free from sin. We are no longer enslaved to sin. And friends, please hear me. I, I'm not saying that, that we do not sin. We still sin. But when we come to Christ, all of a sudden we have a new, deeper desire. We have a, a longing, a desire for righteousness. And the Holy Spirit conforms us moment by moment, day by day day by day, sanctifying us, maturing us, transforming us into the image of his Son. Do you want to be healed, Jesus asks. For the man in our text, his physical disability stood at the forefront as his biggest problem. For us today, it could be a, a far different problem. But what I want us to see and understand is that Jesus stands at the forefront as not as the last option, but instead as your first and greatest answer to all what plagues you. Now, There's another uh, parallel in our text that, that punctuates this very point that I'm talking about this morning. That, that in this text... We see that through the physical conditions represented by this group of disabled people, and even this man that Jesus is interacting with, we see the description. They're described as blind, lame, disfigured, weak, paralyzed. And I want us to recognize that this not only describes their physical condition, it is a description of their spiritual condition. In fact, before we came to Jesus Christ, those are the words that described us. And if you're still separated from Jesus Christ, these are the words that still describe you. In other places, like Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul uses the scripture that you were once dead in the trespasses of your sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 3, Paul writes, For while you were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And what's significant here is this word that Paul uses in Romans 5, 3, for weak, is the same root word that we have been used in the Gospel of John for the invalid, the disabled, the disfigured. It's the same word. And so what does that mean? That means as we're looking at Paul's writing in Romans 5.3, he's connecting this recognition that, that while you were an invalid, Christ died for you. While you were still weak, while you were still infirm, while you were still uh, disfigured, while you were still fill in the blank. Christ died for you. The reason why this moment is so important for us to understand is that we live in a world that is ruled by the notion that we pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Too often we hold on to the words of Ben Franklin as if they are in the Bible, and those words are, if you God helps those who help themselves. Friends, those are not biblical words. In fact, those words are quite antithetical. It is the opposite of what Scripture teaches. 
But even here in our text, Jesus has not sought out the abled body, the spiritual leaders, or those members of the academy. Jesus has sought out the infirm, the weak, the powerless. And to them he asks, do you want to be healed? I want us to recognize that this man in the first century lives in a world very much like our world, a world influenced by worldly philosophies, influenced by pride and ability. And as such, he does not answer the question as if he is seeking the grace and gift of God. Instead, he points to his own effort, even if that effort up to this point has been unsuccessful. It isn't God's grace that will heal him in his mind. It is the superstition of water, of angels, of who gets to this pool of water first. And so friends, do you want to be healed? He's not asking how hard you have worked at your job, how seriously you've taken your Bible studies or your other studies how well you've done at managing or acquiring wealth and influence, what you have sacrificed for your employer or for your family. Jesus is not asking you if you deserve healing. Jesus is asking you straight and simple, do you want to be healed? And friends, our answer should be as simple as the question that is asked. Our answer should be yes, yes, Lord, Heal me, yes, Lord, transform me, Lord, guide me and keep me. But sadly, I fear that many who hear this question will not answer Jesus' question. Jesus asks the question, do you want to be healed? And my fear is Jesus gets this response of silence. Do you want to be healed? And your mind automatically is thinking about work tomorrow. Do you want to be healed? And you think about all the problems you're having in your relationships with your friends, with your wife, with your kids. You're thinking of your money woes. You're you're thinking of all these other obstacles that are in your life. Jesus stands before you and says, do you want to be healed? And the only thing that you can do is feel sorry for yourself, feel sorry for your condition. You do not give Jesus an answer. Jesus is asking the question, wanting you to answer it, willing to heal you, willing to give you a gift that is far more uh, valuable, far greater than the mind can even imagine. And too often, people who hear the offer, the question of Jesus, just stand before the question in silence. I want you to realize that Jesus' question does not dismiss the, the real challenges and struggles in our daily life, but instead what it shapes, what it reminds us of, is that Jesus is the only real cure that can ail the problems that we face in a sinful and fallen world. I want us to recognize that when Jesus comes into our life, he is not tackling the small issues and small problems first. He tackles the largest, most significant problem that exists in our life. (coughs) He's eradicating the source of the problem so that we can begin to heal and move forward to actually begin living. And we see in our text, Jesus tells this man to get up and take up your bed and walk, and the result is this man is healed. He takes up his beds and walk. And what I want us to remember, and I mentioned this last week, is if our primary focus is, is accepting the miracle, but rejecting the miracle giver, then we have fallen woefully short of the great gift that God is providing us. Because God is giving us something far greater than just simply the miracle of healing. He has given us the miracle giver himself. And it is a gift. Thank you. And it is a gift of surpassing value. Do you want to be healed? 
The question is simple. Your answer to the question should be equally swift and simple. You know, in a moment here, we are going to observe the, the Lord's Supper. I, I want to pray for us, and then we're going to distribute the, the bread and the juice, and, and then I want to, to share some, some closing words on, on our understanding of, of what it is that we're doing as we observe the Lord's Supper together. Lord, it is such...